Hello everyone and welcome to our new unit. Unit 7 is about the structure and function uh, in animals and we're beginning this um, unit with a look at the diversity in the animal kingdom. So if you'll remember when we looked at all of the kingdoms and here is a representation of the six kingdoms um, if, and just a quick review, here we have eukaryotic kingdoms, the plants, animals, fungi, and protists. And we have the prokaryotic kingdoms, eubacteria and archibacteria. Um, those are combined into one kingdom in the five kingdom classification system. But that's just a reminder that we actually have um, all life represented here in classification and we're going to focus in on one particular kingdom and that is the animal kingdom. So let's take a look at that. Now just another reminder, the levels of classification were kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We're going to start at the top. We're going to look in the animal kingdom and we're going to look at all of the different phyla. Uh, that's plural for phylum, and these are all of the different phyla in the animal kingdom. And we're going to look at what kinds of organisms occupy each of those different phyla. So these sound a little strange, they are Latin, um, but we're going to look at every single one of them. If you'll notice, if we start over at this side, we're going to first differentiate between organisms that have true tissues and those that do not have true tissues. Um, those would be the sponges. Uh, all these others have true tissues. Then we're going to look at different kinds of symmetry, and organisms are uh, divided into those that have radial symmetry and bilateral symmetry. And then there are some other uh, differentiation, differentiating uh, characteristics of each of these phyla. So let's start with the phylum porifera strange kind of sounding name, porifera, represents all of the sponges um, on our planet. Uh, I don't know if it helps you to think of pores and how sponges are kind of porous, and uh, porifera has that sound to it. So what are sponges anyway? They are invertebrates. They do not have a vertebra. Uh, they are made up of two cell layers and only one body opening. Uh, they do not have any true tissues. They don't have organs or organ systems. And they are generally asymmetrical. Uh, we don't recognize any special form of symmetry in sponges. They, most of them are also sessile, which means they do not move. Next phylum we're going to look at is the phylum nidaria. The C is silent on there. It starts with a C, but it's pronounced nadaria. What is that? You may or may not have heard that word before. They are also invertebrates, and they are made up of two cell layers, and they have one body opening. Uh, they are organized uh, more so than the porifera, the sponges. They're or they have tissues with different functions. And if you look at these pictures down here, you are definitely going to start recognizing some of these organisms. Um, their name actually uh, comes from the stinging cells that are contained um, in their um, in their uh, in the organisms themselves. Uh, they have nematocysts. Uh, they're the stinging. They uh, sting their prey. They uh, use those to capture food. Um, <clears throat> they also have radial symmetry. And let's take a look at types of symmetry in case you have forgotten. There are, well, asymmetry that we discussed with the sponges, but there are two kinds of symmetry, bilateral symmetry and radial symmetry. Bilateral symmetry is the kind of symmetry um, wherein you can divide an, an organism or an object um, in two and have a right and a left side. Radial symmetry, on the other hand, um, is the kind of symmetry that uh, the organism can be divided along many multiple different planes, not just one, um, through the central axis and be divided into halves. So if you look at the top 
of this organism right here, you can see that there would be more than one way to divide it in half and have equal mirror images from each other. And Nidaria all have this special radial symmetry. Examples of, of uh, organisms are hydra, jellyfish, different kinds of coral, sea anemones, um, and uh, those are pictures of those organisms. So the next phylum we're going to look at is platyhelminthes. It's a big word, but the phylum platyhelminthes refers to all flatworms of the world. They are invertebrates. Uh, they have flattened solid bodies and no body cavities. There is only one body opening for food to enter and for waste to exit. They do have bilateral symmetry, um, which we just discussed. Uh, they can be divided along only one plane to form right and left halves that are mirror images of each other. And you can see that there would be the plane that uh, these planarians could be divided um, right here or here. Um, that gives them bilateral symmetry. So here are some examples. We have a, a couple of different parasitic organisms, a fluke and a tapeworm. Um, and then here are some planarians that are not parasitic. They're free-living. Phylum nematoda. I'm going to look at nematodes now. Nematodes are roundworms. Nematodes are invertebrates with a tube-like digestive system. They have two body openings, which is a serious improvement from just one. They also have what is called a pseudocelum. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. They are bilaterally symmetrical. Um, here are a few examples. We have a couple of parasites and a free-living nematode. Uh, what is this pseudocelum? Um, it is a type of body cavity. And we're going to take a look real quick here at different types of body cavities and what they have to do with classification. They actually have a lot to do with how an organism um, interacts with its environment, its, its ability to be mobile, and um, how large the organism can grow as well. First, let's look at acelomates. So flatworms, those were acelomates. They have no body cavity. Um, the food and water uh, that, they, that they ingest, that, that they digest, they, it actually simply travels through their solid body by the process of diffusion. Remember that word. So that's what we call an acelomate. Pseudocelomates, which are these nematodes right here, uh, roundworms, they have fluid -filled, a fluid-filled body cavity that is partly lined with mesoderm. The pseudocelum in their, uh, these organisms' body provides support for the attachment of muscles, and it allows the organism to be more efficient in their movement. A coelomate, uh, we have not yet looked at any coelomates, but the next organisms we look at will be coelomates. Earthworms are an example of those. They have a body cavity that is surrounded by mesoderm and in which internal organs are suspended. The coelom acts as a watery skeleton against which muscles can work. So you can see there's a huge difference between uh, organisms uh, based on their type of body cavity that they possess. Let's look at the phylum Annelida. Annelids are just segmented worms. Um, and they're very special. They they're invertebrates with seg segmented cylindrical bodies. And what's interesting about these segments is that each one has its own muscles, and groups of these segments have different functions, um, such as digestion or reproduction. Uh, they, uh, annelids have two body openings, so um, that is the same as the roundworms, and they are also coelomates. They have a coelom. They are bilaterally symmetric. Here are a few examples. Earthworms, leeches, bristle worms are also some of their examples. Phylum mollusca. Mollusks are invertebrates with a muscular foot for movement and what we call a mantle. It's a membrane that surrounds their internal organs. Shelled mollusks uh, have a mantle that secretes their shell. 
Uh, mollusks have a digestive tract with two openings, and they are also coelomates, and they are bilaterally symmetrical. You can see that by these examples. Look at the little snail here. It's obviously bilaterally symmetrical. We have a slug, clams, squid, octopi, or um, mollusks as well. There are basically three classes of mollusks. There are gastropods, which have either no shell, like the slug, or just one shell, like the snail. There are bivalves that have two hinged shells, like these clams. And then there are cephalopods. Um, they don't have shells. Uh, they have instead muscular tentacles, and they can swim by jet propulsion. These are cephalopods here. Phylum arthropoda. This is an exciting phylum. It is incredibly diverse, very large. Um, if you've ever been to the uh, Butterfly Pavilion, they have a very large collection of different arthropods that you can go and visit and look at and observe. Two out of three animals on Earth are arthropods. It's a lot of arthropods. There are just a lot of these organisms. They're invertebrates. They have a tough outer covering called an exoskeleton uh, that protects and supports their soft internal tissues and organs. They also have jointed appendages. They use those for walking, sensing, feeding, and mating. Uh, jointed appendages are incredibly useful uh, for their life on land and for their ability to be mobile and um, it enhances their locomotion tremendously. Uh, they are coelomates. They are also bilaterally symmetrical. And here are some examples. In our large phylum of arthropods, we have insects. And you're probably familiar with these. I'm sure you've studied insects before. They have three body parts and six legs, and they are extremely diverse. We have arachnids. In other words, uh, most people know those as spiders. Uh, ticks and mites are also arachnids. They have two body parts and eight legs, uh, scorpions or arachnids. Crustaceans, these uh, shelled creatures are also arthropods. Um, horseshoe crabs, centipedes and millipedes are arthropods. And um, this is possibly one of the most diverse um, phyla in the animal kingdom. Phylum echinodermata. I'm sure you've heard the word echinoderm before. Echinoderms, um, a lot of people, I think, think of simply a, um, a sea star or a starfish. They are invertebrates with hard, bumpy, spiny endoskeletons covered by a very thin epidermis. And if you've been around um, starfish at all, you recognize that definition probably. Um, some of them have long spines that are used in locomotion, like here. If you've ever stepped on one of those, you know they have very sharp spines. Uh, some, they, they all uh, move using a very unique water vascular system. And they have tiny suction cup-like tube feet. They are coelomates, and they have radial symmetry, not bilateral. And you can see that if you look down, face down on this star, um, you can see that obviously it would have more than one plane of symmetry. So these are all examples. Sea daisy, a feather star, a sea cucumber, a sand dollar, sea lily, brittle star, sea urchins, and starfish. Phylum chordata. Here is our last phylum in the animal kingdom. And this is a really interesting one. Uh, let's take a look at the um, criteria for being in the phylum chordata. At one stage in the organism's life cycle, uh, these chordates will have a notochord, which is a long, semi-rigid, rod-like structure along the dorsal side. It's, uh, dorsal would be the back, as opposed to ventral, which would be the front, um, kind of, uh, the front of the organism. At one stage in the life cycle, chordates will also have a dorsal hollow nerve cord. It's the fluid-filled canal lying above the notochord. If you think about um, us, for example, as um, mammals and human beings, we have 
this uh, long, semi-rigid rod-like structure along our dorsal side, it is a vertebra. They are vertebra. And the nerve cord would be the uh, fluid fill canal lying above the notochord. Um, pharyngeal pouches are also something that at one point in the life cycle, chordates have. They're paired openings in the pharynx. In some of the organisms, they can develop into gill slits. They can be used to strain food from water. They can be used for gas exchange um, in taking oxygen or air. Also, at one stage in the life cycle, there will be a tail or evidence of a tail. Uh, there are both invertebrate chordates and vertebrate chordates. So let's take a quick look at these. You may or may not have heard of these organisms before, but invertebrate chordates include lancelets, which are these little organisms here, and tunicates, or sea squirts, and those are these organisms. Uh, you've probably seen pictures of tunicates many times and not had any idea what remarkable organisms they are, but they are invertebrate chordates. Vertebrate chordates, uh, you should be very, very, very familiar with. There are five of them, and I'm sure you've studied them before. Fish, right here. Amphibians, uh, an example there. Reptiles, birds, and mammals. Um, those are the five vertebrate chordates that belong in the animal kingdom, and that brings us to where we belong in the mammalian uh, class of the uh, phylum chordata. So here are a few advanced ideas. You're welcome to read through these and see if something sounds interesting to you to study further. I look forward to seeing um, some of your work, and I'll see you in class. Thanks.